Hey everyone and welcome back to Bye Holly G, welcome to today's video. So this is going to be the first out of a few videos in a small series where I talk you through respiration and it is designed for A-level biology students, however I hope that this is useful regardless of where you're studying. So in this video it's going to be an introduction to respiration and then in the next few videos I will talk you through the process of respiration and go into quite a bit of detail. Definitely give this video a thumbs up if you enjoy it and you find it useful and I will make more of them in the future. So let's start with the basics. What is respiration? So this is essentially the process where we transfer energy from food to the bonds of ATP. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate and ATP is this molecule that stores energy. It's what we say is a short-term energy carrying molecule. As I said, we get this energy from food. However, glucose is our primary respiratory substrate. Now, what I mean by that is glucose is the main energy source. Glucose is what our bodies like to break down and use to generate energy or ATP. However, we can use other molecules such as amino acids and fatty acids, for example. But just remember that glucose is our main or primary respiratory substrate. We should also say at the start that respiration can be aerobic, which means it uses oxygen or it can be anaerobic and that is where respiration takes place in the absence of oxygen. So now let's look at our equation for respiration. If you take anything away from this video, please remember this equation. So glucose plus oxygen is broken down and we generate carbon dioxide, water and ATP. And then if we turn this into a symbol equation, glucose is C6H12O6. And that combines with oxygen, as I said, to give us carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. And to balance this equation, you can pause the video if you want to do it by yourself. But what you have to do is you just have to add a triple six. So you add a six in front of oxygen, a six to carbon dioxide, and a six in front of H2O. So those are big sixes. And I have always remembered it as triple six or the devil's number. Our next question is where does respiration occur in eukaryotic cells? So a eukaryotic cell, you might just have to familiarize yourself with that term, but for now you can just think of it as an animal cell, like a human cell. And in eukaryotic cells, the majority of respiration takes place in the mitochondria. As I'm gonna talk about, respiration is broken down into distinct stages, and the majority of those take place, as I said, in the mitochondria. Moving on to look at the mitochondria, then we're gonna ask what is the structure of this organelle? So this is a diagram of a mitochondrion, a single one of these organelles. And we're gonna start from the outside and work our way inwards. We have the mitochondrial outer membrane at the very outer edge. And you can remember this as mom or in America, just mom. And then just inside that we have the mitochondrial inner membrane. So you can remember this as MIM. And between those two membranes, we have what we call the intermembrane space or the IMS. And then enclosed within the mitochondrial inner membrane is another space called the matrix. So it's important to remember that the mitochondria is a double membraned organelle. And because it has two membranes, it means that we have two spaces. As I said, the IMS or the intermembrane space between your outer membrane and your inner membrane and then the matrix inside the inner membrane. And what you should note about the mitochondrial inner membrane is that it is folded. And those foldings are what we call cristae. And that just basically describes the infoldings of the inner membrane. So they are not necessarily distinct or separate structures. It's just describing the foldings of that inner membrane. Now within the matrix then, that space in the middle of the mitochondria, we have a few structures that I'm just gonna point out. So we have mitochondrial DNA because they have their own DNA. So we call that mtDNA. And they also have their own ribosomes. And if you know anything about ribosomes, they are the structures where protein synthesis takes place. And in the mitochondria, we have smaller ones that are called 70S. I have a video that gives you a tour of animal cells and that might help you out here. So feel free to check that out if you want to. And then the final thing to mention are the mitochondrial granules, just because you might see them on a few diagrams. Now, I don't want you to worry about these or stress yourselves out because Research is still currently being done and what they're composed of is not really needed for this video. So if you want to do more research, feel free, but just know that you're not gonna be asked about mitochondrial granules. Moving on then to a more important question, what are the different stages of respiration? As I said before, respiration is broken down into discrete steps. And I'm gonna break it down into four main stages because this is how I learned it and this is how I actually teach respiration when I'm tutoring. So today I'm just gonna name the stages and say where they occur. And in future videos in this series, I will go into a lot more detail. So the first step, step one is glycolysis. 
Now, it's really important to remember that glycolysis doesn't actually take place in the mitochondria. It takes place outside the mitochondria in the cell in the cytoplasm. So it is the only stage that occurs outside the mitochondria. The second step, which is sometimes not described as a step in its own right, However, as I said, I am going to do so here and it is called the link reaction. And as the name kind of like implies, it links glycolysis, which is the first step to the third step, which I'm going to go on to talk about. And that is the Krebs cycle. But before we look at the Krebs cycle, I'm just going to say that the link reaction, it takes place in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, so the next step then, as I said, is the Krebs cycle. And this is a cycle, again, as the name implies, and it takes place in the matrix. And then the final step of respiration is oxidative phosphorylation. And this is probably the most complicated step. However, it's really important because in aerobic respiration, so respiration that uses oxygen, it is where the majority of energy or ATP is made. And it takes place on the inner membrane. So it takes advantage of the cristae. Because as I said, the cristae are those infoldings of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And those infoldings increase the surface area of the mitochondrial inner membrane. So it means that oxidative phosphorylation can take place at a faster rate. And so respiration overall can be more efficient. The final question that we're just going to address in this video is really important to help you understand a lot of what's going on in respiration. And this question is what is reduction and oxidation or otherwise known as redox combined. So the first thing you need to remember is oil rig. O-I-L-R-I-G. So this stands for oxidation is loss and reduction is gain. And more specifically, it means that oxidation is loss of electrons or hydrogen whereas reduction is gain of electrons or hydrogen. Now, the reason why we can say electrons or hydrogen is because if we look at a hydrogen atom, a hydrogen atom is composed of a nucleus with a central proton surrounded by a single electron. So because an electron is part of a hydrogen atom, we can define oxidation and reduction in terms of hydrogen or in terms of electrons. And we can also define it in terms of what we call a proton. And a proton is just a H plus atom. So it is a hydrogen atom that has lost its single electron. So it is simply that proton in the middle. So we could say oxidation is loss of electrons, a proton or a hydrogen atom in its entirety. And then reduction is gain of electrons, a proton, or hydrogen. You might just want to replay that if it doesn't make sense, but hopefully you'll get your head around it. And then I also just want to say here that oxidation can also be defined in terms of oxygen, but that doesn't follow oil rig because in this case, oxidation is the gain of oxygen, whereas reduction is the loss of oxygen. However, when we're looking at respiration, I just want you to focus on oil rig because that is most important. The final thing for this video then is let's just define an oxidizing agent and then let's also define a reducing agent. And this is just an extension of reduction and oxidation. An oxidizing agent is something that oxidizes another substance and in that process, it gets reduced. On the flip side, a reducing agent reduces something else, but itself gets oxidized. So because an oxidizing agent has to oxidize something else, it means that it has to take away electrons or hydrogen from the other substance and it takes them for itself. So when it gains those electrons or hydrogens itself, it means that it is reduced because it's gained them. I remember oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And then on the other hand, a reducing agent has to reduce something else. So it has to give another substance electrons or hydrogen. And when it gives away those electrons or hydrogen, itself will become oxidized because it's lost them. So I hope that makes sense again. Feel free to slow this video down or play it again. And yeah, leave any questions or comments down below. Definitely like this video and give it a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're new and you look forward to more biology content on Biology. And I will speak to you very soon in another video. Bye guys.